All right, and we're off. All right, so I'd like to welcome you all to uh, part three of our virtual tour of the Smithsonian's National Museum of Natural History in Washington, D.C. So we ask that you don't record the tour or publish any of it on social media. Today, we'll explore some of the exhibits at the Smithsonian's National Museum of Natural History. And some of these exhibits have a connection with the Bible, and we'll explore those. Now, we don't use the phrase natural history much anymore, but a natural history museum is pretty much the same as a science museum. And the National Museum of Natural History is the most visited science museum in the world. Now, in part one of our tour, we visited the first floor of the museum, and then we went up to the second floor for part two. So let's pick up on the second floor as we make a quick stop to the Garden Lounge. Now, the Garden Lounge has some really interesting plants. Now, plants can be very interesting, especially when we consider how wise our creator was in designing them. Did you know that there are nearly a hundred different plants and trees mentioned in the scriptures? Also on display in the garden lounge are orchids. Now orchids are one of Jehovah God's most beautiful and diverse creations. And when we say diverse, we mean diverse. Have you ever seen a monkey face orchid? A Well, there's the monkey face orchid. A tiger orchid, the white egret orchid, wow, the flying duck orchid, the moth orchid, uh, and this is the white dove orchid. And then one of my favorites, uh, the ballerina orchid. How amazing is that? Doesn't that show that our creator has a great imagination? Now, next is an orchid that's, I don't know, kind of plain, kind of vanilla. Oh, that's because it's vanilla. Now, you might not recognize it by sight, but you would definitely recognize it by its smell. This is the vanilla bean orchid. Now, vanilla is obtained by scraping, uh, scraping it from inside the dried seed pods. Now, the flower of the orchid, vanilla orchid, only blooms for 24 hours, and it must be pollinated during that time, or else it dies. That's why vanilla flowers are almost exclusively pollinated by hand, which is very labor intensive. Now, let's make a quick stop to this part of the museum called Objects of Wonder. It's like they put things here because they didn't know where else to put them, kind of like the leftovers. But a lot of this stuff is really cool. For example, one of the exhibits is what makes things blue? Now, the color blue is all around us, but not all blues are made the same. Uh, structure or chemistry gives plants, animals, and minerals their intense shades of blue. And understanding the physics can be a little confusing, but let's give it a shot. Now, you've heard of uh, the term primary colors. Do you ever wonder why those are considered the primary colors and not some other colors? And maybe you've seen it where there are different primary colors, depending on the context of what we're talking about. That's true. There are two types of primary colors. They are called additive and subtractive. Let's look at the additive primary colors first, or the wavelengths of light. Now notice how all of these three colors added together give us white light, or white in the middle. Now the additive colors are red, green, and blue, the additive primary colors. But these are actually colors of light. They're not colors of paint. Red light is at the left of this spectrum. Notice its wavelength, 740 to 625 nanometers. But why do those wavelengths make us see red light? Well, you've probably seen a prism 
And you know that what is called white light is actually made up of different wavelengths all added together. Reverse the prism and you see that white light is made up of all the different colors of light added together. Let's look at how this affects our eyes. You see, we have two kinds of special cells in our eyes. These cells are located on the screen at the back of the eye called the retina. Rod cells detect light and dark, and cone cells allow us to see color. Now we have three types of cone cells, and they are called red, green, and blue cone cells. Those are the wavelengths of light that those cells react to. Now red cones will jiggle or vibrate when hit with the energy from just the red wavelengths of visible light. Green jiggle when hit with the energy from only green wavelengths of green light. And blue jiggle when they are hit with the energy from the blue wavelengths of light. And when they jiggle because of that exact amount of energy that's hitting them, they send a message to our brain to make that color in that spot. And combinations of colored light gives us other colors. Really, it's amazing how this works. Our creator is so wonderful to give us color vision when black and white would do just fine. It's just like David said, I praise you because in an awe-inspiring way, I am wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know this very well. Now our retina is like a TV screen or a computer, computer monitor that has very good resolution. If you look closely at a TV screen, you'll see a bunch of green, red, and blue pixels. Now the pixels on our retinas activate from the cone cells and we see color. But let's look at how the structure of an object can also affect which wavelength of colored light we see. Now, morpho butterflies owe their brilliance to the structure of their wing scales. Now, these butterflies are covered in microscopic scales that have many tiny grooves that scatter light, and they reflect only blue wavelengths. So blue are the only ones that we see. So it's actually the shape of the scales that make them look blue. Only the blue wavelength of light can get through the scales and bounce back to our eyes. Because the exact wavelength of light is reacted to the shape, if we view the butterfly from different angles, we get different shades of reflected light. And this is called iridescence. Now, it's the same thing with some feathers, like those of, uh, of these birds. Now, these birds are unique. Do you know how you catch a unique bird? Unique up on it. How do you catch a tame bird? Tame way. Birds and butterflies are not the only thing that show blue because of iridescence. Some very beautiful stones have it too. Opals owe their flashy colors to microscopic silica spheres that make up the mineral structure. The spheres act like little prisms, splitting the light into its component colors. This is another beautiful opal at the museum. But some things are blue because they have pigments. Pigments make things blue in a different way. But again, it's about jiggling. Now, pigments are associated with subtractive primary colors. Paints and colored ink are examples of pigments in things. Pigments are chemicals that have a shape that will jiggle when the right amount of energy, called its natural frequency, hits them. And this comes from visible light. When that happens, they absorb the light energy that's coming into them. They change the energy from the visible light to heat energy when they absorb it. So any object with any type of color actually gets a tiny bit warmer when it's hit by light. Now the subtractive primary colors are cyan, magenta, 
and yellow. And all together, they form key or black. Now, most pigments do not jiggle with all of the color wavelengths of light. The wavelengths of light that don't make the pigments jiggle and absorb are reflected back as the color that we see. For example, if a surface appears red, it means that all the colors within white light are being absorbed, absorbed except the red. The red bounces back to our eyes. When zero wavelengths are absorbed, that means all of the wavelengths are reflected and things look white. When all of the colors in light are absorbed, none are reflected and things look black. So this reflection and absorption of energy also helps explain why white objects stay relatively cool in the sunlight and black objects warm up quickly in the sun. Now, this mandarin fish gets its blue color from pigments in its cells that absorb all wavelengths of light except blue. This is an example of biological pigments creating color. Here's another rare example. The blue poison dart frog is one of the very few animals known to contain blue pigments. Now, the blue color in this stone comes primarily from the mineral lazurite, and it's called lapis lazuli. And this mineral has been an important source of blue pigment in many cultures. Now, the deep, vivid shade of blue that painters call ultramarine, which means beyond the sea, was originally made by crushing up lapis lazuli and mixing it with binding agents to make paint. Now, ultramarine, the quality of the shade is described in its name. This is the superlative blue, the blue to end all blues, the blue to which other hues quietly aspire. It was rare, expensive, and highly prized by Renaissance painters. Michelangelo couldn't afford ultramarine. He left some of his paintings unfinished because it was impossible to get it. On the other hand, Cleopatra had plenty of money, and so she wore it as eyeshadow. Now, in 1824, a reward of 6,000 francs was offered to anyone who could develop a synthetic alternative to ultramarine. Now, two men came forward within several weeks of one another Jean Baptiste de Gamay a French chemist, and Christian Mellon, a German professor, professor. The committee awarded the prize to Gamay, much to the displeasure of Germany, and the artificial blue became known as French ultramarine. Now we move on to our next group of exhibits, bones. Now a bone is a rigid tissue that makes up the skeleton in most vertebrate animals. Bones protect the various organs of the body, and they produce red and white blood cells. Bones store minerals, they provide structure and support for the body, and they allow us to move. Now, bones come in a variety of shapes and sizes, as you can see in this skeleton of a dog. Now, they have a complex internal and external structure. They're lightweight, yet strong and hard. In fact, they're four times stronger than concrete. It's amazing that there are also different types of bone within the same bone. Now, the outer part of the bone is very dense and it's called compact bone. The inside of the bone is more sponge-like and is called cancellus or spongy bone. There's actually a famous European landmark that was designed after spongy bone. Uh, man has been copying Jehovah God's creations for years. That famous landmark, of course, is the Eiffel Tower. Now, since bones are the body's foundation, 
The first woman, Eve, was formed from a rib bone taken from Adam. So Adam could truly say of Eve, this is at last bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. Now, there are, are a lot of skeletons in this museum's closet, like mammals with teeth, mammals without teeth, carnivores, herbivore skeletons, bird skeletons, snake skeletons, fish skeletons, and of course, human skeletons. Before we go on, I found this humorous. Moving on. Now your feet and hands make up over half of all your bones. Now most people have 206 bones, but you had more when you were born. Some bones fuse together as we grow, like the bones in our skull, called fontanelles, before they fused. Until they fuse, a baby has a soft spot on their head. A skeleton was so sad and lonely when he realized he had no body. He tried to be a happy skeleton, but his heart just wasn't in it. So he went to a bar and said, bartender, I'll have a beer and a mop. Tragic. We now go on to the Orkin Insect Zoo. Here we see exhibits about some of the smallest, but arguably the most important animals that there are. Although we don't often think about it, our lives are greatly affected by what insects do, both good and bad. Almost everywhere you look, you find these six-legged critters. Now the wildly diverse class Insecta includes ants, bees, flies, beetles, and much more. Now, these creatures have a body composed of three segments, the head, thorax, and abdomen. They're encased in a hard exoskeleton, which is why they crunch when you squish them. All insects also have a pair of antenna, compound eyes, and three pairs of jointed legs. Now insects develop in one of two ways. They may be born as smaller versions of the adult, called nymphs, and then just grow up. So grasshoppers and crickets do this. You can see that on the left, it's called incomplete metamorphosis. But for most insects, the process is much more complicated. It involves four different stages and is called complete metamorphosis. Maggots change into flies, caterpillars change into butterflies, and aquatic larvae transform into airborne dragonflies. When we think about it, metamorphosis is truly staggering. It's kind of like changing a train into an airplane. Now, the Bible also recognizes a change in form. The Bible uses the Greek metamorpho four different times. Twice when Jesus was transfigured, in reference to this, and so twice when Jesus was transfigured. The third time is in reference to the spiritual change in anointed Christians. And the fourth involves us being transformed by making our minds over. Now, there are more than 800,000 known varieties of insects. Some are drab and uninteresting, but others are beautifully colored with beautiful designs. All the shades of the rainbow can be seen. Although a lot of people see insects as pests, that damage things and spread disease, actually only a very small percentage of insects are harmful. The majority either help or are neutral to humans. Well, let's look at some ways that insects affect us. It's been estimated that 85% of flowering plants are either completely or partially dependent on insect pollination. That includes all the fruits and vegetables that we eat. We also get some dyes and shellac from insects. Shellac, which is used to finish furniture and fingernails, is secreted by the female lac insect. 
but shellac has, is used for other products as well. And insects can serve other useful purposes. You can eat them. Yes, uh, insects were considered clean for food in the Mosaic Law. Exodus 11, 21 and 22, of the winged swarming creatures, you may eat only those that have jointed legs above their feet for leaping on the ground. Of these, you may eat various kinds of migratory locusts, other edible locusts, crickets, and grasshoppers. And speaking of eating insects, what about, the, what about those locusts that John the baptizer ate? Well, Matthew 3 verse 4 tells us, Now John was clothed with camel's hair and had a leather belt around his waist. His food was locusts and wild honey. Now, in case you're wondering, or if you're ever out in the woods without food, here is the recipe for making locusts, crickets, or other grasshoppers. First, pull off their heads, and the guts will probably come with it. Now, tempting as they are to eat, throw the guts away. Only eat the head. The guts are edible, but removing them reduces the risk for getting a parasite. Because of this risk of a parasite, always cook your insects before eating them. Then you remove the wings and the legs. If you have a pan, you can dry roast them or skewer them and roast them over a flame, campfire style. While the majority of grasshoppers are safe to eat, there are a few exceptions. You don't want to eat any brightly colored insects like the Eastern lubber seen here common in Texas. These can make you sick. Now, as you know, locusts can also be a threat. They migrate in large swarms and do a great deal of crop damage. Remember, they were the eighth plague brought on Egypt by Jehovah. Now, to go with his locusts, John also ate honey. There's an exhibit dedicated to bees at the museum. Have you ever heard that honey is bee vomit or bee barf? Well, that's mostly true. Now, technically, the honey never truly enters the bee's stomach, but the honey first enters the bee's body, second is churned around and mixed with the bee's body fluids, and then third is regurgitated by the bee. Sounds a lot like barf to me. The female honeybee is the one who leaves the hive and collects nectar and pollen for the babies that are forming. The female does all the work. I know many of you ladies out there are thinking to yourself, I know that's right. Well, if it means anything to you gentlemen, only the female bees sting and only female mosquitoes suck blood. So do what you want with that information. On second thought, don't do anything with that information. Now, have you ever wondered why beekeepers use smoke? They use it to keep bees calm when they open up the hive. When bees sense danger, they release an alarm pheromone called isopencil acetate. Now, smoking the beehive masks that pheromone, and it allows the beekeeper to do his work without the bees swarming. So some of the bees do raise an alarm, but the other bees can't hear it because of the smoke and they can't respond to it. Now, when a female worker bee finds a good stash of pollen and nectar, she goes back to the hive and tells the others. She does not dance, vibrating her body, turning around in circles and shaking her backside. It is called the waggle dance. I would demonstrate the waggle dance for you, but my wife has forbidden me ever to do that again in public. But how do they do it? How do they know how to do this dance? And how do other bees interpret the dance when another bee does it? There's no Arthur Murray for bees. There's no bee dancing with the stars. 
But the Bible gives us an answer. And that answer is instinct. Proverbs 30, 24. Uh, the Bible talks about animals being instinctively wise. Where did they get this instinct? From their creator. Proverbs 30, 24. Four things on earth are among the smallest, but they are instinctively wise. Charles Darwin had something interesting to say about bees and instinct. He said, such simple instincts as bees making a beehive could be sufficient to overthrow my whole theory. Hmm, interesting. Another interesting insect thing to see here at the museum is the butterfly exhibit. You can even see live butterflies. Isn't that an interesting name, butterfly? Uh, they're not flies, however. Flies are in a completely different group. So how did they get that name? Well, one Dr. Spooner used to say butterfly in his lectures instead of flutterby. Now, William Spooner was an Oxford history professor. He was most known for supposedly mixing up the syllables in a phrase. And such phrases are now known as Spoonerisms. So let's look at some interesting examples of other insects, like beetles. No, not that kind of beetle, this kind of beetle. Now beetles are of the insect order Coleoptera. Coleos means shield, and all beetles have a shield covering their wings. They're the most biodiverse group of creatures on earth with more than 380,000 species, making up 40% of all species, sorry, of all insect species in the books. The British scientist J. Haldane once reportedly was asked what things nature could teach us about a creator. He quipped that you can assume that our creator has, quote, an inordinate fondness for beetles. Now, the ladybug is a beetle. Do you ever wonder why they're called ladybugs when half of them must be male? Well, the name ladybird originated in Britain where the insects became known as our lady's bird or the lady beetle. Now, Mary from the Bible, who is also called our lady, is the inspiration for the name. Now, one theory is that the red bugged looked like early paintings of Mary, which depicted her in a red cloak. Now, the heftiest insect found today is New Zealand's giant weta, a cricket-like beast that can weigh more than a pound. The longest insect, meanwhile, is Chan's megastick, native to the island of Borneo, and stretching almost two feet long. The smallest insect is this. Hmm. Can you see it now? There we go. Its scientific name is Tinkerbella Nana, named after characters in Peter Pan. It's about 2.5 times the width of a human hair. Now a prominent feature of insects is their compound eyes consisting of many individual units called amatidia. A popular misconception is that each unit acts as its own eye, each perceiving a total field of view. But in fact, amatidia act more like pixels when added together, make a picture for the insect. Now the dragonfly is widely considered to have the most impressively amatidia studded compound eyes with about 30,000 pixels per eye. These amatidia per permit a nearly 360 degree field of view. Now, most insects live for only a few days or weeks as adults, but there are exceptions. Take, for example, the red harvester ant queens. They can live as long as 30 years. But taking the top prize are termite queens, 
which may reign for half a century, according to the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Have you ever wondered why sometimes ants have wings? I mean, it's not like they have far to go. They walk almost everywhere. They have wings to mate. The males fly into the sky first, and then the females fly up to meet them. Wherever the queen lands, that becomes the site of the new mound. After mating, they all lose their wings. Right? Now, this large white uh, insect is a termite queen. Termite queens can produce 6,000 to 7,000 eggs in a single day. An entomologist once reported a queen termite cranking out an egg at a rate of one every two seconds. A termite walks into a bar and asks, is the bartender here? Two termites go on a date. The waiter, sa the waiter says, what would you like to order, sir? The termite says, we'll have a table for two. What did the termite say to the chair? It was nice gnawing you. Moving on. Now in 2019, a new dinosaur exhibit opened called the David H. Cook Hall of Fossils, Deep Time. Now, at first glance, a fossil might look like a normal bone, but in fact, it's the result of a chemical transformation, fossilization, that takes place before the remains of the dead animal can decompose. Now, one common form of fossilization is permineralization. In this process, the original organic material is replaced by minerals that are present in wet sedimentary deposits. Now, most fossils here at the museum are formed by permineralization. These are not their actual bones. Those bones are long gone. Now, here we see a T-Rex and a Triceratops. Now, this is an interesting exhibit with a history that most people don't know. The T-Rex is nicknamed the nation's T-Rex. And the Triceratops being eaten is named Hatcher, named after the paleontologist who discovered most of its bones. Now, Hatcher here first appeared at the museum in 1905. And at first, it was a very awkward looking dinosaur. See, no one had yet found a complete skeleton of a Triceratops. So curators used bones from 10 different individuals and made some educated guesses to put them all together. The result was a creature with a head that was too small for its body, arms of four different lengths, and feet from a duck-billed dinosaur. Now, in 2001, Hatcher got a makeover and went back on display until being eaten by a T-Rex in 2019. Here is a Diplodocus. You might remember this guy from Jurassic Park. Oh, another Diplodocus. Here we see a Pteranodon suspended above the gallery. And here are some other dinosaur fossils in the exhibit. A Dimetrodon, saber-toothed tiger. But not all fossils here are of dinosaurs. Here's an Irish elk, the museum's oldest mounted fossil skeleton, which has been on display since 1872. Look at the giant antlers. We also see a giant ground sloth, a mastodon. All right, in part one of our tour, we visited mammals from Africa. Uh, let's go see a few more interesting creations from Jehovah on our way out. Now we'll end with Australia. So Australia obviously is known for kangaroos. There are four major species of kangaroos in Australia. The antilopine, the eastern gray, the western gray, and the red kangaroo. But the red kangaroo is the best known. 
The male is the largest of all marsupials and weighs up to 200 pounds. It stands taller than most humans. The gray kangaroo is another example of a marsupial. The marsupials, as we know, carry their babies in a pouch in front, and baby kangaroos are called joeys. What do you call a lazy joey? A pouch potato. Kangaroos can jump up to 37 feet in a single bound. Some have been clocked at speeds of up to 40 miles per hour and have jumped over fences more than 10 feet high. Now, kangaroos hop because they cannot move their legs independently and they cannot walk backwards. Did you know that male kangaroos flex their biceps to impress females? This photo is not photoshopped. Also, in Australia, more people are killed by kangaroos than by sharks. And finally, did you know that you can put 31 bananas in a kangaroo's pouch? I know this for a fact, and uh, they won't let me into the zoo anymore. Now, almost as well known as the kangaroo is the koala. Now, I'd like to tell you more about koalas, but I can't because they, did, they said I didn't pass my exam to become a koala expert. They said I didn't koalify. We'll introduce our next Australian marsupial with a question. What do you call a heavy set cat who just ate a duck? A duck filled fatty puss. And speaking of duck-filled fatty pusses, this is one of the strangest animals there is. This is the duck-billed platypus. When the first platypus specimen was sent back to England from Australia in 1799, the scientists who examined it thought that someone was playing a trick on them. They thought that someone had attached the bill of a duck to the body of a beaver. Now, a Dr. Shaw, assistant keeper in the Nat natural history section of the British Museum in London, actually tried to cut off the bill. And the marks of his scissors can be seen on the original skin of the first platypus. Now, one of the most remarkable and weird aspects of the platypus, its ability to lay eggs, wasn't discovered for another hundred years. The only other mammal known to lay eggs is the echidna, also known as the spiny anteater. It's also from Australia and thereabout. Now the soft rubbery bill of the platypus is very sophisticated and it's much different than the bill of a duck. It has many receptors on it that allow it to find prey. While the platypus is underwater, its bill is its main contact with the world. Its eyes, ears, and nose are all shut tight. Now, male platypuses have hind legs that are armed with ankle spurs connected to venom glands. He pokes his spurs into an attacker, just like someone riding a horse would spur the horse. Thanks to the platypus, we see yet another example of our creator's endless imagination and sense of humor. Well, there you have it. Uh, we hope you've enjoyed our tours to the Smithsonian's National Museum of Natural History. Now, just a thought before we go. These tours were put together to show the magnificence of our creator, Jehovah God. When we look around us, we're reminded of the scripture at Romans 1.20. For his invisible qualities are clearly seen from the world's creation onward, because they are perceived by the things made, even his eternal power and godship. Yes, on our tour, we saw evidence of Jehovah's great power and energy in the way he created stars and our planet, Earth. How he created the moon his wisdom in how he created water. 
and DNA. How he created the great variety of plants and insects. Animals above the water and animals below it. So we leave with one last scripture that sums it up. Psalm 104, 24. How many your works are, O Jehovah. You have made all of them in wisdom. The earth is full of what you have made. Thank you for joining us. See? Now, this tour is absolutely free. Uh, although there are some expenses uh, that are involved. So if uh, you are interested in uh, donating to cover some of those expenses, this is this is how you may do that. All right. And then we have a few minutes here at the end. Uh, if you have any questions or comments, feel free to use the raised hand.